welcome back. I hope you had a good lunch and a good morning and we are ready to pick it back up this afternoon. And we kick off the rest of the day with our next speaker, Ivor Cummins. I'll have to say it's fantastic to be here and huge thanks to Willem and all the team to invite me here. And it's great to be with like-minded critical thinkers <laughs> at home. That's not always the case. So today I want to go through, actually you'll see the date, September 8, 2020. And this is a viral update in which I gave a lot of predictions and I explained a lot of the viral vectors of what was going on in COVID. But interestingly, the New York Times saw fit to do a hit piece on me two weeks later. So Irish guy in the New York Times. It, they hit Trump and then they followed on to me. <laughs> and, <laughs> but the funny thing was they questioned everything very carefully and to avoid defamation and they didn't really say a huge amount, they just questioned. So I'm going to go through what was in that video briefly on all the major points and then look back over two years and say, well, was I correct or not? Which in a sense is, were we correct or not? So one thing I ca called out was the Gompertz cur curve. I had interviewed Professor Michael Levitt, the Nobel Prize winner, and he had clearly called out Gompertz behavior, not in all regions of the world, you know, because viral dynamics are complex, but showed that, and you can see in Europe here in my first slide, clearly Gompertz across the board. And Sweden's in there as well. Sweden with no lockdown, no masks, and kids up to 16 in school throughout. And you can see there was no difference. So they questioned it, but it's apparent. I also included slides. These are German from the 1918 flu and look familiar. Yeah, same Gompertz curve. No lockdowns back then. You know, people hardly knew what was going on. So there you are. So we're going to use the checklist as I go through the facts in the matter. And this is because I'm an expert problem solver at 25 years or more in leadership of problem solving multi-factor complex problems. And we always do an autopsy after a very complex problem has been resolved because we need to learn for the future where we got it wrong. So Gumpert's dynamics, well, I was correct. Professor Levitt was correct. That's just the way it is. And then seasonality I covered, and this existed long before COVID, and you can see there coronavirus family are overlapped with influenza and very seasonal, particularly in Northern Europe and in America. And uh, the reference is there, so that was that. And I showed uh, in animated version, 10 minutes, I'm gonna, gonna spend a minute here. Uh, I showed that Italy locked down after their curve had turned, so I explained that that's proven and they peaked in the kind of March period which is the seasonal pattern for Northern Europe broadly but I also showed that Brazil with no lockdown famously uh, was lower than Peru which had a military grade lockdown from April 2020 right and you can see clearly the massive seasonality and I also pointed out and it's published that Brazil in the human sewage they found SARS-CoV-2 in November 2019 which beautifully illustrated it was in the population for Italy it's published from a cancer study and a blood bank that SARS-CoV-2 antibodies were in Italy in October 2019 and yet the seasonal peak happens independently and nothing to do with lockdown this book, The Transmission of Epidemic Influenza, I was very lucky to get sent to me back at that time from Dr. Edgar Hope Simpson. And he was a doctor in England who set up in the 30s the first influenza transmission laboratory. And he spent 50 years on the puzzle of influenza, influenza transmission. And he actually answered a lot of our questions. And he basically showed that in the tropics versus Northern Europe and America, etc., you had those patterns and they were played out during SARS-CoV-2 beautifully. This was later in 2021. I was just showing the sheer obviousness of it. You can see there the Irish ICU loading in 2020. And then we opened up fully with no restrictions all summer long, pretty much. But nothing happened. And amusingly, in October, you'll see there a little hump. That was kind of a pseudo-viral triggering. But the Irish authorities saw that, put in a lockdown 
so lockdown would get the credit when the curve naturally turned down, but they were too late. So they were over a week after the peak and they put in a level five lockdown, right? And the curve, of course, just kept going with no change. So yet again, illustrating. But I also called out that in 2020, you had that curve shape and the summer uh, doldrums with no vaccine. And then in 2021 with the vaccine, you have the same essential thing. So by the by. Here you can see in America, and again, I had a lot of slides, I'm gonna be brief here, but you can see the seasonality. So American landmass is kind of multiple regions and seasonalities for viruses. So you can see upper Midwest, regardless of policies, see the way they all peaked the same, and coastal Southeast. And you can do this for all the regions of America. It always follows based on regionality or geography, right? It doesn't go up and down based on the measures whatsoever. So seasonality was massive in SARS-CoV-2. But the WHO said in July 2020, they felt they had to come out just when it was clear as day that it was profoundly seasonal. And they gave a bulletin to the world to say it is not seasonal. And at the time I figured, well, if you're gonna bring in nonsense masks in the middle of the summer in Europe, when the ICUs are empty and the hospitals are empty and nothing's going on and you want people to accept that nonsense, you better tell them it's not seasonal, right? So they believe there's some meaning to it. But in mid-21, it began to come out and it began to be okay to say it was seasonal, right? In 21, a year late. But in 2020, you get your YouTube video taken down for saying that. So this is the inherent institutional corruption that's obvious through this issue. So powerful seasonality, check. No question about it, we were correct, and it's accepted now. So the next one was de facto immunity. So I had interviewed Professor Beda Stadler of Switzerland, and he's been known as the vaccine pope. He's an industry guy. He's developed vaccine technologies and patents, so he's very credible also called the Fauci of Europe. So emeritus professor of immunology and kind of a hero in Switzerland, but he caused a bit of trouble when he began to tell the truth. So de facto immunity, when you look at up to the end of 21 this is, and you've got all those PCR positives, that's six out of 100 people with mega testing of PCR, that's 6%. Now, if you're really generous, even though there was mega testing of PCR, and you say maybe 20% were PCR positive, right? That's being hugely generous. Well then, over two full seasons and massive spread, 80% were de facto immune. And de facto immune means that you essentially have enough prior immunity to the coronavirus family from T cells and, and other uh, physiological aspects that you don't really catch it, you're not really affected, and you don't really transmit. So the New York Times took huge offense at that 80% de facto immune, but they were wrong. Yeah, yeah. And the data shows it now. So 80% de facto immune, well, I was correct a little too early, and Professor Stadler, but correct nonetheless. Check. Now, I went into mortality quite a lot, and I worked with Professor Levitt and many others on this, but Euromomo is the ultimate database for around 360 million people in Europe. And I pointed out that 2018 excess deaths, because every year in flu season you have excess hump of deaths, was around 140,000 people, which sounds a lot, but it's out of 360 million, so it's not so much. And then the data right through the wave in Europe of 2020, there was around 180,000. How would that justify shutting everything down, destroying the economy, ruining the kids' education? It, it doesn't. But the argument might be, but if we did not lock down, it would be higher. And that's a lie, and we'll get to that shortly. Also, I pointed out that 2019 was remarkably low impact. Now, that will create dry tinder, and it will create a group of frail elderly who might otherwise have passed but did not and that can easily jack up your next season and you can see 2020 right up to march was remarkably low so a huge build up of frail elderly immunocompromised who might otherwise have sadly passed were there and then there was a sharp peak but the point is 180 versus 140 
makes no sense. Spanish flu spike versus COVID spike. And this is Sweden. I love this from Johan Hellstrom. Got it from the Swedish mortality database. It's referenced. And there's the Spanish flu spike. And you can see the COVID spike. And this includes April, their worst month. Do you notice something? One picture from a country that did not lock down. So that's not an excuse. One picture says it all. But no one listened, of course. But the COVID spike, you can see there, their monthly figures, no different than many prior years in excess mortality and tiny compared to the Spanish flu. Deaths comparable to bad flu, as Professor John Lee in England said many times in the mainstream media, within the envelope of a bad or severe flu. That's correct. Then the uh, modeling. <laughs> you all love modeling. So I showed these two graphs in September 2020, and you can see on the left there and the right two different kind of modeling papers based on Imperial College, which happened to receive around $300 million from Bill and Melinda Gates over the last eight years. So maybe not too surprising their modeling is mad. But <laughs> there's with no lockdown orange and with moderate lockdown uh, in gray. But Sweden actual with minimal lockdown is the blue line. And their PCR badge deaths, they're not even excess mortality, which is much lower. But there is the modeling versus reality. And on the right, the dotted line down the bottom is the cumulative COVID mortality. And all the other lines are various, various degrees of lockdown, right? And here's from our movie, covidchroniclesmovie.com. It's free. We got a big Kickstarter, made a movie about all of this. But again, two papers based on Imperial College showed the expected mortality for Sweden if they did not lock down. Red and yellow there, or orange. Green is the actual excess mortality, right? So that's how bad it was. So impact modeling was nonsense, not just unscientific, but nonsense. Absolutely, clear as day. Now, I went through some other dry tinder type because this is so important. The dry tinder concept, or low mortality, unseasonal, if you will, causing a higher hit the next season is huge in this. So here's from the mortality.org database. You'll see in the top left, Sweden, I think. And you'll see this huge trough in mortality on a rolling average. You know, that's going to hurt the next time a bad virus comes along. And well, it did they got hit reasonably hard. And you can see Netherlands, Great Britain, Spain, all these countries that got a good hit, they all had troughs. Now, if you look at Finland and Norway, which he had the data for, you can see the difference. They don't really have as much seasonal dynamics. Now, for various reasons, and it's complex, but the reality is they didn't have any trough and they didn't really see such a peak. Okay, compared to Sweden. And also Spiegelhalter, uh, there was a paper out showing this effect with a different analysis. And they showed that if your previous seasons were more severe, uh, you got less hit from COVID. And there's pretty much a straight line relationship. It's going to be noisy because there's lots of factors, but there you go. And this paper, 16 possible factors for Sweden's high COVID death rate, 16. And they make the point that lockdown appears to be the least of it. And the big one they had was this dry tinder effect. You know, that's huge, okay? And here's the latest data a few days ago. Uh, OS on Twitter, I messaged and got him to do some graphs and the references are there. They're from mortality databases. Sweden is the green country. That's the country I'd like to be that stuck to science. You can see Sweden's excess mortality in 20, the 2021 season and the 21-22. And Norway, Finland and the others, look at the right hand side. And remember that Norway and Finland and all those supposedly did lock down, though that's debatable. But now they've, they're getting their hit post-vaccine. And do you remember the argument was, we're just locking down until the vaccine comes. And then, you know, it'll be fine. Well, no, it wasn't certainly wasn't. So Sweden versus Nordics is absolute nonsense. No question about it. Clear as day. And that's the ironic thing. This stuff was so apparent in 2020, and not to be arrogant, but myself and a massive worldwide network were pulling our hair out. Well, <laughs> not me. 
uh, uh, just how stunningly obvious this was to someone who's experienced in logic and problem solving and data. And he didn't even need virology, epidemiology per se, or, or immunology. It actually is clear in the data, even without the deep science in those arenas. That's what's really frustrating. The Spanish flu comparison. Do you remember in 2020, there was all this propaganda? And in Ireland and England, anyway, I saw most of it. And it was all about the second wave. And they meant a Spanish flu second wave. They didn't mean just a winter resurgence of a seasonal virus. That's not scary. It was a Spanish flu. Remember, its second wave back in 19 had this huge hit. And it hit different people than the first wave. It hit young people. Well, that's what they were threatening. Now, at the same time in Ireland and England, they were taking apart and taking down all their emergency capacity in hospital and all their capacity that would keep COVID people separate and not have hospital transmission. All that sensible stuff that they set up in early 2020. Well, while they were telling us that there was a horror wave coming, <coughs> simultaneously, they were taking away all their hospital capacity. Right, so that shows malice of intent. But anyway, Here's the uh, Spanish flu, and this is the peak deaths per million. And you can see on the right COVID-19 2020, and this is Swedish data. And it shows some other uh, excess mortalities for prior decades. So again, you'd say nothing to see here. But the story is bigger than that, because Spanish flu, there's published papers showing the age distribution of death. And you can see it's dominated around the median of 30 years of age of people technically in their prime, mothers, fathers, family people dying. The old people were a relatively small slice. So it's the opposite of COVID and infant deaths, huge, right? So when you actually do a brief analysis of that, this COVID compare of deaths versus Spanish flu, which looks like around 10 times less, which it is, if you correct for the age of death and life years lost, that compare becomes something like that. And I couldn't actually make a line narrow enough in PowerPoint. <laughs> that was the minimal, but that's it. You're talking about a hundred times approximately, you can argue about the numbers, a hundred times less impactful in life years than Spanish flu. But we're all told Spanish flu was the thing we had to be thinking about. So, Spanish flu comparison, utter, utter nonsense, right? But it was all over the media. There you go, check. So we're learning here by looking back. We're being honest and looking back and looking at the data, right? This is good. So Carl Hennigan, professor in England, got in a lot of trouble for being honest. And he's a professor of evidence-based medicine. He's literally a professor in evidence-based medicine and a medical doctor and an epidemiologist, etc. He made the point in the summer, and I thought it was fantastic. We've opened up fully. We have pubs open with no masks, and we have around 300 million people interactions. Simple math, but nothing happened, right? And it, it speaks to seasonality and the irrelevance of measures. But by the time I put this slide out, it had gone up to maybe half a billion people interactions. And it's clear as day, nothing happened. But New York Times didn't like it. And this was in May, I put this out. In engineering and complex problem solving, you've got to be really rigorous and you've got to use structured tools. But one thing you use is the hypothesis for again spreadsheet. This is crucial because you may have 10 or 15 hypotheses, these vying. And you must put down, and this is a discipline I held with all engineering teams under me. You must put down the evidence for and against your hypothesis and you must review it regularly because people get a pet hypothesis and they begin to forget that evidence has grown against it. So I did one for lockdown being effective and all the evidence was against. I mean, the stuff on the left that's for came from Imperial College and some associational junk papers and modeling. People don't realize there is no credible evidence supporting lockdown in the world. And there are massive, massive negative evidence pieces. Uh, so that, that's the way it is. And that was May 2020. So I put up a blog post and it's still there. I'm up to 53 published papers now that show lockdowns are ineffective and the cost benefit is atrocious. And there's actually over 100 
And as per Professor Karl Popper, logic in, in science and problem solving, a negative piece of evidence, a black swan, is vastly more powerful than a positive, affirmative piece of data. Yet here we have endless negatives and no positive supporting data. So that's the way it is. So lockdown highly ineffective, no question about it. No one can claim lockdown is effective without being a farce, right? Check. Masks, oh God. <laughs> 40 years of published papers and influenza is the same transmission mechanisms as coronavirus. And we know now, and we knew in 2020 it was aerosol, it ignores face masks, essentially. Plenty of published papers saying that, and the Dan mask, the only study for SARS-CoV-2 with masks, came up null as well and showed no benefit, effectively. But it didn't matter because masks were decided at a high level to be needed independently. I'll just put a couple of graphs in. I had huge amounts of them before, but I'll just show one or two. I mean, here's counties over 100,000 people, mask mandates versus none. I mean, spot the difference. It's just, there's myriad, myriad empirical data all over the world. Masks never show an effect in empirical, real-world data, only in modeling and biased papers. And this was the famous one I thought I'd show it, North Dakota. Like, the difference between North and South Dakota, and there's around a million people in each, they're all the same culture, same region, perfect kind of natural experiment. And one of them went with the masks and all the nonsense and restrictions, one of them didn't. No difference. You see this everywhere. So masking highly ineffective, and I could go on all day at this one. It's no question about it. Check. So the case demic. This is something I got in trouble for, and the New York Times hated it, and the modeling doctors who were driving hysteria hated it. But the case demic was a great phrase, and I didn't make it up, but I loved it. And I did a load of graphs painstakingly from our world in data or the other resources. And we call them mirror graphs. So on the top you put the cases, and then with the same time base you put the deaths on the bottom. So during a real epidemic as such, you see on the left, there's cases and slightly lagging, there's deaths, uh, which you'd expect. But then in the late summer when they're bringing in mandatory masks and trying to terrify us, cases are rising because testing is going through the roof. But nothing's happening in the hospitals, but no one seems to notice this. But these graphs helped uh, illustrate it. No ICU, no hospital, but the cases going up and up and up and the media going crazy. There's UK, same thing. Look at the bottom on the right there. Cases, cases, media crazy, nothing happening. Uh, Germany, Switzerland, same as. Spain. Spain had a couple, one person per million per day in that right-hand period was dying with a positive PCR. One person per million per day. Um, so it had something, but nothing. And then Netherlands, you can see you guys got a good case demic going there, yeah? Look at it. Absurd. And yet all of the experts would never answer this absurdity. Of course they wouldn't. USA is slightly different because I always pointed out from the very start, it's not one region. It is different seasonal. I mean, the south of, of America uh, has more like Mexican or more like Brazil or Peru. It's got a kind of a southern tropical pattern. So America did keep going, but because of different regionality. But it was the same kind of thing. So case-demic was absurd, but it was used to drive massive restrictions all over the world. And the other point being made there, and I know someone later will get into PCR in detail, PCR, highly misleading. A positive PCR is not a real case. A real case is someone who is very sick or hospitalized with the disease in question. That's been the definition forever. But now you've got a PCR positive, or people in ICU in Ireland. I mean, if you fell off a ladder and ended up in ICU and you had a positive, that's it, you were COVID ICU. I mean, it was insane. And the funny thing was, in late 20, when we had the second wave, if you will, we had around 28% positivity in Ireland in the testing. So any, like if one in three are testing positive, you know what I mean? The hospitals are going to be full of COVID cases, but mostly they weren't. 
And I'm going to finish now, and I think I'm roughly on time, or maybe ahead of time, I'm not sure, the timekeeper. But this is really important, and I went through this in September, and a lot since, and in our movie. And it's around demographics. And most people don't real well, you guys may, but most people just don't realize this obvious problem. So here's Sweden mortality per million, and the link is there, it's to the Swedish government database. And you can see that 2020 was a little nasty, fair enough. And we'll note that they have a mortality per million average of around 9,300 per, per million people. So that's just their baseline mortality because they're an aged demographic, and this is important. Here's the dry tinder. 2019 was in ways the most unusual year in Swedish history because it was so low in mortality. Right? But if you look at how much it was low by, rough and tough, it's roughly the same as the excess they had the following year. You don't need to be a professor of mathematics to work this out, or a logistician, right? And just to show the UK, the UK is around 9,800 per year, because like Sweden, it's an aged demographic. Now, the UK has more problems because their metabolic health is in the toilet compared to Sweden. But anyway, you can see the UK as well in 19 had a very unusual low mortality for whatever reason. Maybe Corona was out there and keeping the flu inactivated. That's another whole story. But you can essentially see, rough and tough, the following year you get a balancing. Now, that's not the whole effect, but you can just get an idea there how much of the effect it is. And Ireland then, there's something wrong. Ireland only gets 6,300 per million dying per year, compared to the UK and Sweden up near 10,000. You know, what the hell's going on? Ireland got some elixir of life, you know, leprechauns and gold. Yeah? Whiskey. <laughs> you want to move to Ireland, yeah, whiskey, very good. But it's actually simple. Ireland has a young demographic. That's all it is. And you don't need to look at the COVID year. You can look back 20 years. It's a young demographic. And COVID, as Bill Gates said a couple of months ago, on the record, and I quote, we didn't realize that COVID has actually a very low mortality rate. And it's a disease mostly of the elderly, kind of like the flu. And then he caught himself and said, but, but not exactly like that. <laughs> so even Bill Gates admitted it on 92NY two months ago. I got it. Um, but there you are. So Ireland has a young demographic. So you don't really see a harvesting effect because they're not really affected. And the CSO, Central Statistics Office, released 2020 mortality, our biggest COVID year. There is no excess mortality in Ireland measurable for 2020. And we know the lockdowns didn't change anything, but that's the narrative. The lockdown saved us. Utter nonsense. Ireland has no excess mortality. And in fact, we actually have more mortality late in 21 excess with the benefit of all the medications. That's where the mortality is coming in. So I'll leave you to judge that one. And you know what? I think, oh, there's one last point. The WHO, and this is a crucial point, 2019 guidelines, I have them. I got them back in 2020. And it's important, here's a little anecdote of what actually happened. Bruce Aylward of the WHO was in China, right, as a bunch of idiots wearing these blue masks and as TV cameras. And he holds up a graph. <laughs> this is just insane to watch. He holds up a graph showing Wuhan and showing China's Gompertz curve, which we know is natural and it goes through a cycle. And he points at it and he said, look what China have achieved with their lockdown. He's pointing at pure nature, nothing to do with lockdown. Look what they did. And then he says the immortal words, all of us in the West, essentially, are going to have to do this. That was it. That was February, I think, 2020. But the reality is their own guidelines, 40 years of Western science culminated in the WHO 2019 pandemic guidelines. And there are no masks, no point, no evidence. Track and trace, waste of time once a virus that's got a fair spread or a high RO, which this one has, 
gets into a region. No point doing test and trace, it won't be effective. And no isolation of exposed individuals. There's no point. They knew that. That's all on the record, 2019, all thrown in the trash, and we decided to copy China. That's institutional corruption of the highest level. There is no other explanation. So we'll finish our checklist. And like Jaws, we're going to need a bigger boat, if you remember that. We're going to need a bigger checklist. And we're going to fill in the last few. 2019 WHO guidelines were correct. There is no question about that. Sweden has proved that. All of the published data, hundreds of papers have proved that. Check. Scientific Sweden was correct, and I think we need to keep emphasizing this because it was a perfect control country, and it romped home, and Anders Tegnell romped home. Judge me in a year's time or two years, we just saw the other Nordics mortality. Yeah, correct. And lockdown, just to emphasize benefits, especially versus costs, pure fraud. There is no other word I can use for lockdown now except data fraud. That's just the way it is. So anyway, that's kind of a, a whistle stop tour through the facts and I uh, hope you enjoyed it. So. Fantastic presentation, Ivor Cummins, thank you. And now I would like to open it up to our panel. We are joined by Pierre Capel, Peter Borger, and Carol Beckman.